Hello, and welcome to Booth's Distinguished Speaker Series with Dr. Griffin Myers. My name is Jessica Jaggers, and today you will hear three, the voices of three people. You'll hear my voice um, offering some questions uh, for our guests, and then also um, Dean Madhavarjan and Dr. Griffin Myers. Um, all other guests today will be uh, muted, and so if you have questions that you would like to submit, you can do that by typing a question in the Q&A box at any time. If you have any issues with your audio, you may want to shut down any programs running in the background. Um, our presentation will last for about 60 minutes today. Dean Rajan and Griffin will speak, and then you will have about 20, 25 minutes for questions from you. This session is being recorded and we'll make it available to you on our YouTube channel later today. On behalf of Chicago Booth, thank you for joining us. We know that you have a lot of demands on your time and attention right now, and we appreciate your interest. So with that, I will turn it over to Dean Rajan. Thank you, Jessica. Hi, everybody. Uh, as Jessica said, I'm Madhav Rajan. I'm the uh, Dean at Chicago Booth and also the George Schultz Professor of Accounting. I hope all of you are doing well. I want to thank you for taking the time to, uh, to be with us today. Uh, it's really a pleasure for me to have all of you here as we welcome Booth alum, Dr. Griffin Myers, co-founder and chief medical officer of Oak Street Health to our virtual Distinguished Speaker Series. At the DSS, the Distinguished Speaker Series is a long-standing Chicago Booth tradition, and we bring in high-profile leaders from the government, uh, from business, from and from uh, leaders of the community to the school to share their insights and experience with us. We held our first virtual Distinguished Speaker Series uh, in the spring, and it was very successful. Uh, we had incredibly insightful chats with uh, esteemed alumni, such as Kurt Del Bene from Microsoft, uh, Jenny Scanlon from UL, uh, Byron Trott of BDT, um, and Tom Ricketts, owner of the Chicago Cubs. And we learned a great deal about how these executives and their companies responded and navigated their way through uh, COVID-19. We resumed the series this autumn. We had great conversations with uh, Ann Mukherjee, uh, Chairman and CEO of Perno Ricard North America, uh, with JP Gan from uh, Inns Capital in Shanghai, and uh, recently with Dave McLennan, CEO of uh, Cargill. It's really a pleasure for me to welcome today's speaker. Uh, Dr. Griffin Myers is co-founder and chief medical officer, as I said, of Oak Street Health, which is a network of value-based primary care centers for adults on uh, Medicare. Uh, the company is headquartered in Chicago, but it's grown to 70 centers and counting in 11 states since its founding in 2012. Prior to Oak Street Health, Dr. Myers did his residency in emergency medicine at Harvard Medical School at the Brigham and Women's and Massachusetts General Hospitals. Uh, Griffin is young global leader at the World Economic Forum. He's a fellow of the American College of Emergency Physicians, a research associate at Harvard Medical, an adjunct instructor at Northwestern, a presidential leadership scholar and an Aspen Health Innovators Fellow. Griffin has a bachelor's degree from Davidson College, an MBA from Chicago Booth, and an MD from the University of Chicago Pritzker School of Medicine. Uh, we're thrilled to have uh, Dr. Myers here to speak with us today about his career path, his business, and its response to COVID. Thank you for being here, Griffin. Yeah, thanks, Madhav. If you want to intimidate a guy, list all the previous speakers that you've had in this venue. Thanks for doing that. I think I think you're going to do just fine in that company. So I have to start by asking, is that a virtual background there behind you? No, this is the real background. I am uh, actually at the the home of a fellow Boothie in Park City for a few weeks. So um, I'm enjoying his backyard. OK, um, let me start by going back to your uh, to your education. What made you choose to do an MD? And when you did the MD, were you already sure that you were going to do an MBA? How did that that come about? Yeah, you know, I um, I grew up in a small town, and uh, in so many cases, the leaders that I saw around me in that small town were physicians. So really, for me, medical school was as much a, um, you know, I had a pretty constrained view of the universe and what the options were for a career, and that was the one that I saw real servant leadership in. So that's what led me to medical school. Um, and then, of course, what I think got me into in studying business and economics was being at the University of Chicago. Um, I had a, a lecture that I don't, you know, it's funny in the moment, I knew it was an important bit of advice, but as a first year medical student, um, one of the, the medical school faculty members said, 
you know, we're a small medical school here and a relatively small but very impactful university. When you look around the country, when you look at larger medical centers, when you look at Harvard, when you look at Hopkins, uh, they have a lot more NIH dollars. They're doing a lot more research. But when it comes to the impact and the, the grant money per faculty member, we're the far and away the leader here at the U of C. And the reason for that is that we have not only a great medical school, but the best business school and the best law school and the best economics department and the best all these other things. And uh, the advice was, if you want to thrive as a Chicago scholar, do it at the intersection of fields. And so for me, um, being being on campus and having access to the rest of the university and recognizing that rather than just studying medicine, I needed to look for an intersection, the intersection I fell in love with. I, I took a survey course that Kevin Murphy and a few others taught uh, when I was a first year medical student because they don't make you pay extra tuition back then. And, uh, and that's what really got me interested and that became the intersection of two fields I wanted to study. Mm -hmm. And you've become a very successful entrepreneur. And when you joined Booth, did you know that you wanted to be an entrepreneur? Sort of what pushed you along that path? You know, I'd say I always did know, but I wouldn't have been able to admit it at the time. Um, I'm embarrassed to say this. I didn't take a single entrepreneurship course at Booth. Um, I, I focused a lot more on the technical components of the trade, learning accounting and finance. and. Um, but I do think that there was some element of, I didn't see entrepreneurship as building a business as much as I saw it um, creative problem solving. And, and for me, especially wanting to be, as a physician, wanting to solve social problems, I really defined myself as a social entrepreneur and was there to get these skills to help to solve the problems. And for us uh, in healthcare, there are so many major just glaring problems to solve. And for us at Oak Street, they were health equity, quality, and affordability. And so when you did the idea for Oak Street come while you were at Booth and what was sort of the genesis of that? No, and this is where um, it's, it's um, I have two unbelievably brilliant and talented co-founders, neither of whom went to Booth. One, Mike Pikos is our CEO and the other Jeff Price is our COO. And they both taught me a ton. And we started the company together in 2012. Um, and, and all three of us are still at Oak Street um, pushing away on solving these problems. But um, the the genesis of the concept was really one that those guys were doing some some consulting. We had all been at the Boston Consulting Group and they had been doing some, some projects in and around value-based care. I had done some similar work when I was there. I had moved on and was, was a resident living in Boston and taking care of patients and frankly learning to take better care of patients. Um, but the concept was one of you know, we, we operate in in a fee-for-service healthcare system in this country. And essentially what that means is um, provider or doctor or hospital does service, patient pays fee. And there's no, nobody's to blame for this, but the way that that's designed was really administrative simplicity. It's the same as ordering off a menu at a restaurant. You choose something, they do it to you, and you pay for it. The, the problem is, is without putting blame on anybody, um, that creates a healthcare system that's in the business of sick people. So the goal is do the thing that I'm going to do to you as a patient, get you to go away, get you, you know, well enough that you, uh, you know, feel like something worked, but sick enough that you come back. That's sort of at, at its very basis level. Those are the incentives. And nobody should be surprised then that we have the healthcare system we have that's deeply inequitable, that uh, is quite low quality, is very, very expensive, and that tends to chase things that generate the revenue in that model versus others. And obviously, there's been a bunch of work done on this, but um, our business model really came from this idea that all the stuff that we know works, right? Investing upfront in preventive care, in managing chronic disease, in supporting people with their, their mental and behavioral health, in, um, in helping them optimize social determinants, which are really far and away more important inputs to health outcomes at a population level. Doing that stuff matters. So we needed to create a business model that allowed us to invest upfront in those services, extend that capital, uh, but then realize the gains from that when you're able to keep people, as we say at Oak Street, happy, healthy, and out of the hospital. And we can certainly talk about how that works. But um, the business model was really one from a combination of sources. But M Mike and Jeff had been working on this for a while. And, and uh, when we got really serious about putting the business together, we really focused a lot more on, on health equity and on building out a technology platform that would allow us to do that. That's how we got here. Mm -hmm. 
So I had mentioned that we I had spoken to a bunch of alums about the, the pandemic, and that's had a significant negative impact on many uh, medical organizations. How has it affected you? It doesn't seem to have as much, and I was wanted to get your thoughts on how did you make that uh, make that that outcome happen. Yeah, I, so I certainly wouldn't say it hasn't affected us, but I do think that this is the moment that I think we as um, take the politics out of it. We as citizens need a higher quality, more affordable, more equitable healthcare system. Uh, we didn't get that over the last 75 years in a fee for service model. And I think this is really the moment that highlights the failure of that system. I think just to kind of break it down into three buckets, I think the first is I, I feel really lucky to be at a place like Oak Street that very clearly reflects my and, and our values around evidence-based medicine, health equity, and, and provider accountability, because that group then was so locked in to taking care of our patients regardless of venue. And so there was no, um, we were going to do hard, scary things to take care of patients because it was the right thing to do. I think the second thing is um, our business model allows us to be just very uniquely aligned with the interest of our patients. Um, you know, when you when you look at, I mean, you mentioned this, that so many other healthcare businesses have really struggled. And that's true, right? If somebody's not coming in and you're not billing them, uh, you're not making any money. And that creates a real challenge. So I think if you're doing outpatient elective surgeries and people are not electing to have that surgery anymore, um, your revenue is going to be destroyed. For us at Oak Street, right, regardless of whether there's a pandemic or not, we receive a premium. We are fully accountable for all the costs of care for our patients. If our patients have to go to the hospital, we pay the bill. If they need a drug, we pay the bill. If they need an emergency surgery, we pay the bill. Whatever they need downstream from us, we are fully responsible. And so whether there's a pandemic or not, our job is to keep patients happy, healthy, and out of the hospital. And what it meant for us was in this setting, we had to pivot our business. So the business model was a really key advantage. Now, what did we actually do? I think in, in sort of a classic, uh, what we like to say, oaky fashion, uh, we were highly structured, highly deliberate and, and executed on a playbook. And so I think the first is set very, very clear goals and prioritizing our patients, our staff, and then participating genuinely in the community response. And, and so it extends beyond just the folks in our centers to people outside in our communities. You know, step two then was to establish very, very clear safety and infection control protocols. And I'll tell you, that was uniquely challenging, um, mm -hmm. especially dealing with a virus that at the time, you know, in, in March, when we were really making a hard pivot, we didn't understand the pathophysiology of the virus and, and the way that people got sick. And so um, we had to be uniquely conservative and expend every resource possible. Once we knew we could do that, the second, the third thing was to get our patients home. And we did. We, we sent, we are a center based model as much as um, soon you will be able to download Oak Street from the app store, but we will still always be a center based model where people come in and see us. And uh, we moved our patients home and began to see them remotely, um, moved our teams home. And so our teams were practicing medicine remotely. And we went in about a week from doing virtually 98% of our visits or so in the center and a few small couple percentage at home to 93% were done virtually. And to be able to make that pivot over a week, what came from the fact that it didn't matter, we, our revenue didn't change and our job was to keep people happy, healthy and out of the hospital. Um, that remote care model was effective. I think pretty quickly we do recognize though that we take care of a very vulnerable set of folks. We uniquely at Oak Street focus on low income, older adults um, in communities where there's not great healthcare resources. And frankly, there's quite a high burden of disease and adverse social determinants. And so um, anyway, all this to say, we recognize the value of our traditional model and have pretty quickly moved back to a universe where um, you know, we provide transportation to and from centers. So we're able to get our patients in, keep them safe, do what we need to do diagnostically, therapeutically in the center and get them home. And, um, you know, the results are, are frankly sort of beyond expectation. We've managed to continue to keep patients out of the hospital and, and deliver high quality care. And uh, we've opened, gosh, over a dozen new centers this year and welcomed tens of thousands of new folks to, to the practice. So, um, so it works. And I, I, I'm, Obviously, it's it's fun to be on on a side that's thriving in the moment, but I do think the larger theme is this is a demonstration of the weakness of our healthcare system and what we have to do to fix it. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, we talked about the uh, the expansion, Griffin. Do you? What are your plans for continued expansion? Where do you sort of want to end up in a in a steady state? Yeah, I've learned very quickly over the last ninety days not to make forward looking statements, Mato. But um, <laughs> I, I will say that um, you know we we have really ambitious growth plans, and um, as I said, despite the pandemic, the team's done an amazing job opening new centers this year. We've had. Um, like I said, thousands of new patients recognize the value in this sort of care and, and join Oak Street. And frankly, uh, my expectation and frankly, my hope for our country is that we're going to see more and more models like us and our jobs to extend that lead. And we will. Um, we'll, we'll continue to invest in, in the platform and in the services that we provide um, in the culture and the training and the way that we operate on that platform. And then, of course, in, in new care settings, whether it's new centers, new home based care. But uh, we opened centers this year across Texas, New York, Mississippi, some fill-in centers. Uh, we announced a, a really exciting partnership with Walmart where we're going to be working with Walmart to take care of patients in inside of Oak Street Centers in Walmarts in some rural communities, which is a real opportunity. So lots to look forward to. Mm -hmm. So uh, Griffin's joke about the forward-looking statements, of course, refers to the fact that the Oak Street is now a public company. Um, and so perhaps you could talk about what was the impetus for deciding to go public and what was that process like? Yeah, this is where I think credit to, to Mike and Jeff, my, my two co-founders and Tim, our CFO, and really the whole team in, in thinking through this process. Um, stepping back for a minute, right? If, if, you're, um, if you're a private company, you kind of have three options. Uh, number one is you can sell to a strategic. Number two is you can recap and just have new private owners. Number three is you could go public. The world's like actually pretty small. Um, for us, one of the values, and not to get into too much of the nitty gritty, but um, you know we're boothies and, and appreciate the value of, of uh, a market equilibrium and a price mechanism. And um, patients having choice in the way that they consume their Medicare and Medicaid benefits is important. Uh, that marketplace is an important one because different benefit structures matter. We at Oak Street want to be able to take as many different health plans as possible and, frankly, to be agnostic to, to what our patients choose. So what that means is had, had were we to be acquired by a health plan, uh, that would obviously strategically limit what we could do as a business. And I think many people, um, we certainly didn't spend a lot of time thinking about it, but uh, I think a lot of observers thought that Oak Street would be good as a part of a health plan. So to maintain that that strategic uh, sort of multi-payer orientation was important. I think the second thing is independence. Um, I still, as much as we like talking about it as a business, I, I still very much consider myself and our team social entrepreneurs in trying to solve the problem of high quality, affordable, equitable healthcare in this country and hopefully someday beyond. Um, doing that requires a level of independence that that we thought was really important to protect. So I think it kind of constrained the universe to, um, do you go public or do you keep recapping it? And, and frankly, we don't, uh, the good news about this, and I think the good news for us is, as taxpayers and as citizens, all of whom are gonna need healthcare at some point, is that this model works. We can take, measurably materially better care in terms of virtually any quality measure you want. Uh, and we can do so with material and lower costs, which is our margin. So it means that we don't, despite as, 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 as important as technology is to our business model, we don't get paid on ad sales or page clicks, right? Like we, we are, mm -hmm. we generate robust margins. And so that gave us sort of this option to go be independent. And after all of that explanation, it just turns out that, uh, this is a way to lower cost of capital to ensure our multi-payer strategic orientation to ensure our independence and frankly to eliminate the distraction for us and our whole team of of what's going to happen to us uh, it happened to us and now the jobs to get back there and uh, keep taking care of patients and build the best healthcare model we can um so could you speak a little bit to you mentioned you're a, a social entrepreneur at heart and you have a public company now how do you balance it particularly given yeah. that you said from the beginning you've had this notion of health equity as something very important to you do you see trade-offs there how do you manage that that uh, that curve if you will yeah I, I i um so what it makes me think of is anytime somebody says that to me i used to i don't do this anymore my brain used to go to one or two places when you say you're a social entrepreneur either it means that um you you are not a great operator um, but just want to feel good about yourself or um, you're making a bunch of money and and want to find a way to to sort of market what you're doing. And in reality, that that's not how it works for us. I, I'll tell you, I am um, 
I'm an emergency doc by training. I had never been in an emergency department in my life virtually before I started my residency. I passed out cold the first two times I went into a trauma bay, but I chose the field because I wanted to take care of patients, whether or not they could pay me. And uh, I still have the broken glasses from where I fell and hit my face to prove it. So um, that is really where we are coming from at Oak Street is this idea that what we need to do to improve quality and equity in healthcare is frankly just change the structure of how we pay for it and the delivery system behind it. Uh, we have more than enough resources in the system to do so. Um, you know, when, when also interestingly, this fee for service model doesn't have a very high functioning price mechanism in it. And, and I think that matters to us as, as uh, in the booth community is we pay what's on a price list, right? It's, it's what Medicare says a service is going to be there. There's a whole bunch of math behind there, but there's no, nobody's sort of coming in an arm's length transaction to decide that. Uh, once you put a price mechanism into healthcare, which is what we've done at Oak Street by taking that premium, and now we invest in all of the stuff that we know works to try to generate the results to create savings, it changes things. And and I'll speak to it like this, which is to say, you know, people ask all the time, why do you and Oak Street want to work in, in low income communities with really sick people? Uh, who who need a lot of time and attention when the whole rest of the healthcare systems go into nice neighborhoods and trying to do elective surgeries and that's how they're going to make their margin. And the reason for that is in our model, the, the price is actually it's how sick somebody is today and how well we can make them. And so what we're trying to do is go to communities where there is the lowest hanging fruit for sickest people do all those things. It's transportation, it's access to primary care, it's support with medications, it's social work, it's home visits. None of this is rocket science. Now putting this together in a single technology platform that allows you to scale this across multiple geographies and across multiple payers, that's complicated. But once you do that, we've demonstrated that you can work in communities that really need and, and deserve the support, do, do very common sense things to deliver meaningful results. And, and as Mike, our CEO always says, you know, talking about Oak Street is not hard. It's the, it's the putting it all together and doing it that's hard. But that's where our, our business model is totally consistent with our mission. And those things are aligned. And, and just Andy, you asked, you know, have there been ethical considerations and, and challenges? And the reality is we have this incredible um, kind of unfair advantage that our business model is totally aligned with our mission. And we don't need to make the choice of, are we going to put care teams on something that matters to our patients or something that makes money? If it matters to our patients, it will make us money and it will take the money. We can put it back into building that platform out to keep the flywheel going. Uh, you spoke about your initial forays into uh, being a practicing doctor. Do you still get to practice as a doctor? How do you manage your time between uh, you know, running the company and, and being a doctor? Yeah, that's the casualty of the pandemic for me. Uh, until March, I was in our centers every week taking care of patients on Wednesdays. Um, that's been a challenge for me, for sure. And I had a conversation with our, a few of our executive medical directors earlier in the week, actually, that, that that's been the real challenge. And, and it is, it does feel quite disconnected because so many of us are, are working remotely now to support our teams and build out partnerships and things like that. Um, so the answer to that is no. And, and I think the real question is how long until I get back into it? And then Madhav, I forget the second part of your question. Um, just, you know, how do you manage your time? Sort of right now you said you don't do any yeah. of the, uh, the actual <laughs> emergency physician stuff, but when you go back yeah. to that work, you sort of balance the time commitments and what do you do for fun outside of that? Just a third part. I'm a little bit, I'll be totally honest. I'm a little bit worried now that the moment I say to, to Mike, I want to go back and take a day a week and see patients that he's now used to me uh, working at full capacity and may not be super psyched about that, but we'll, we'll have that argument later. Um, you know, it's, I always, I, I, I think about this all the time. Whenever, whenever I used to ask, um, you know, mentors or attendings in the hospital or faculty members or, or whomever it was sort of about how they maintain balance. It always came as a little bit strange now that they'd already sort of like finished the path and um, had made a bunch of money and done all these things. So the advice always seems a little bit weird. Um, I will tell you for me that um, I, I have learned to start by looking at the calendar and scheduling the things that are important to me as a human being first and then letting the rest of the stuff fill in around it. So uh, with the exception of sleep, I, I do schedule on the calendar the the workouts, the the meditation, the time with 
friends, family, girlfriend, the, the, the other things like that. Um, including for me living out in Wyoming, the, you know, time to just go climb a mountain and those things come first. And then these other things do come later. And I found over time, especially, um, especially as leaders, the things that we run out of first is not time or intellectual capacity or, or even resources at this point. Like what we run out of is, is emotional resilience and, and perspective and capacity to make hard decisions. And so I just try to protect that. But um, yo, know, for me outside of work, I actually several virtually at this point, most of my best friends are all booth grads and um, spend a lot of time with them. I love to backpack and ski and hike and climb out in mountains and drive off road. And um, I'm learning to fly little general aviation airplanes. So uh, mostly anything outside um, land, sea or air at this point. Mata. Okay. Uh, so I've heard that you like making craft cocktails. So want to know what's, what's your favorite? You have some subjects you want to play with, with your loves. Yeah. Um, so le less so now in the pandemic than before, because if you're sitting at home making cocktails all the time, it's probably going to be less of a productive time. But um, no, it's something I, I got into with my brother. Um, you know, my, my staples probably a Negroni, which is a classic, but my brother did share with me one uh, not too long ago that's worth trying, which is called an industry sour, which if folks Google that, they'll find it, but it's equal parts. Let's see, Fernet, green chartreuse, lime juice, and simple. So it's complex, but it's good, but it's called an industry sour. Industry sour, okay. Um, so two sort of looking ahead questions, but not about the, the company. I won't put you on the spot, but uh, future of virtual medicine, do you think it has leg? Will we do more of it even after the pandemic? Uh, yeah, I think the answer to that is yes, within certain limitations. Um, and, and stepping back, I think it's very natural to think about virtual medicine as a, as a product. Um, in many cases, I think we, that, that we would sort of ignore that there's a spectrum of care. And in reality, when we segment patient populations, we all need different things. Right now, what telemedicine is very good for is if I have a sort of non-emergent, low acuity uh, condition that, that is not complicated by my existing health or social context, whipping up a doctor on demand or one of these other things and having a conversation with somebody to solve a problem works. I think where this gets more challenging is you know, sort of that old saying, like, why do we rob banks? Like, that's that's where the money is. Um, the, the problem that healthcare needs solved in this country and where we spend the money is not on low acuity, low urgency, um, small items in healthy populations. The overwhelming majority of the spend, like 80% of the spend is spent on chronic disease in people with other chronic diseases managing those. And so I, I do think that it's out there to work. And I do think the nature that it's on demand uh, reduces the transaction cost of having to get somewhere is great. What we need to do next is find a way to integrate that better into the existing care model uh, for how we solve the hard problems. And I will tell you, it was really, there's going to be, you know, thousands of, of PhD theses written on changes that happened during this discontinuity that we're calling the pandemic, and, and many of them will be on this subject. Um, what we found and what I believe we will find outside of Oak Street and in the larger context is that as a stopgap, when you have nothing else, it's fine. In reality, it does not replace a longitudinal in-person relationship in, in places that matter. And so um, what I think we'll continue to see is recognition of that, tools, technologies, and platforms that reinforce the, the longitudinal nature of those relationships. Some of those will be telemedicine. Some of that will be uh, remote monitoring and, and biometrics. Um, and some of those will be better ways to connect caregivers, leaving the patient out of it at that moment so that we can conference and have, have sort of better integrated care plans. So the answer is yes, but with an asterisk that I would lower my expectations and think about it as a part of a product and not a product in itself. Mm -hmm. um one last thing, <clears throat> then I'll turn it to Jessica, because we have a lot of questions, which is, yeah. if you look at the model, is it a very US specific model? Have you ever thought about would this port over to other countries? Um, so so again, Griffin here speaking, uh, no, no forward looking statements. But uh, the reality is this business model was probably harder to get started here in the United States than it would be elsewhere. The, the reason for that is both the political context as well as the social cultural context of 
we have not yet accepted the reality of that we do have socialized health care. We call it Medicare and Medicaid. We only give it to, you know, uh, <clears throat> call it 150 million people. But if you think about it, it's like half the country. Um, everybody else would be used to this. And when you think about what we're doing, look, for example, at the NHS in the United Kingdom. They have global budgets at local levels that start at the level of primary care, and that global budget pays for everything downstream from there. Uh, the only difference is it's not branded Oak Street. I don't think their technology is as thoughtful. I, I don't think it's well. And forgive me, because I know there are many folks who get wonderful, lovely care in the NHS, which is an awesome system. So it's not that. But um, I, I just I think that to think that this works here and only here. Um, is is a bit myopic in the thinking. And frankly, one of the things I get personally very excited about is the recognition that you have to build this platform once. The fixed cost of building the, the Oak Street platform to integrate across the entire co care con continuum and, and to do so in a way that is culturally competent and, and brings in all the data that we need, that is extraordinarily expensive. And we can thank our, our private angel, private and public investors for the capital to be able to build that out and go deliver on that. Um, but once you build it once, there are little things you have to change to make it work in um, really most countries, if you ask me. And, and there's obviously some, some political and regulatory questions about where those revenues can be delivered and things like that. But um, assuming those things can be solved, the idea that we need to have um, a, a well-capitalized, well-structured healthcare system that is globally capitated, meaning takes a global budget and is fully responsible for all the downstream costs of care and, and does that well, that works anywhere. And um, I, I've had a lot of conversations with friends of mine around the world, uh, both sort of friends in the healthcare universe, through the World Economic Forum, through other places. Um, I'm quite confident that this is a model that, that will work in a whole bunch of places, um, really from middle income on up. Okay, fascinating. Okay, uh, Jessica. Sure, actually, uh, quite a few questions coming in. Um, the first one, are there any lessons that you've learned through your experiences uh, co-founding Oak Street Health and, you know, what are kind of some of the do's or don'ts, if you will, um, for some of these people who are aspiring entrepreneurs? Um, yeah, I would say two things. I think the first thing is um, the guys and I joke about this a lot. The number one regret is just that we waited too long to start it. Uh, if, if we think we're ahead now, we would be lapping people at this point. And uh, that's the one. So I think if, if folks are really captivated by a concept and believe in their soul, they have to do this, then there's no reason to wait. And <clears throat> I think the second thing is for for me at least, and and there's part of me that wishes the guys can answer this as well. But, um, you know, I, I meant what I said before. There are hard problems out there, but most of the hard problems are not intellectually hard. Um, the the piece that I learned uh, that I wish I had known before was the most important thing has been having perfect clarity on what my and our values are because those are continuously challenged over and over and it's fun now to be in a place where you know the business works and it's been validated and and it works at a patient level at a center level at, at you know at the, at, at the entity level and we've had that validated by smart people at smart banks and now by the investing community um, but there were lots of times where you don't know and we didn't know and, and we believed it and and the models said it was going to work but in reality what we were betting on were our values and our commitment to evidence-based medicine health equity and this idea that providers or, or doctors shouldn't get paid until and after their patients thrive and I, I now recognize that and I can I can say those here very clearly but you know, if you had asked me in 2012, 2013, we were getting started, how important those were going to be, you know, you, you write those down and you move on. And, and I think I probably should give credit to, to Jeff for this because Jeff was always really good at forcing us at a pretty regular cadence to write down the mission and write down the values. And if those were ever deviating or those we ever had a tendency to change those, um, then that, that would be a problem. And the good news is they never did. And I've still got you know, the very early emails when we were writing these things down together, working all weekend long, um, you know, it, for us at Oak Street, our values were, were those three. It was, you know, uh, being sure that we could be personal, equitable and accountable in the way that we delivered care. So I, I would say those two things. Number one, hurry up. If you know you got to do it in your soul, go do it. And the second is have very, very clear values. 
There's a lot of both folks who are interested in the medical field uh, or healthcare industry, I guess, and there, there are several questions asking, you know, do you think it's necessary to have a medical degree if you want uh, an influential career in healthcare? Uh, I would say the opposite, actually. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that I find quite frustrating, and this is, this is, I don't mean to be too terribly provocative, but um, we have this, uh, for folks who work in healthcare and especially on the provider side, there's this deference to, uh, to folks with medical degrees. Uh, the reason to go to medical school, the only reason, the only good reason is you care deeply about taking care of people and being a servant in that way. Uh, I, I think that you can love the science, um, you can love the pursuit, um, but at the very end of the day, your job is to use your skills and talents to reduce the suffering of your neighbors and your community. And, and that's the reason to go to medical school, not to, you know, get a promotion or, or, or build a separate career. And I will tell you that um, that for me, I do genuinely, I was somewhat surprised, honestly, to, to be leaving when I was a resident, we were starting the business. I just was going to teach patients and take care, teach residents and take care of patients. That was going to be my job. Um, and I think that's been a big advantage because I've not, I've not necessarily been distracted by anything other than those were my underlying objectives. And this is just the way that, that I'm personally going to do that. Going back to my previous one, I think there's this expectation, especially in the provider side, that we have to defer to people with medical degrees. And, and in reality, and, and again, for folks who don't know, it's pretty common for doctors to call those people administrators. And these are like people with terminal degrees, Booth MBA is running large organizations and they get called administrators. And it's insane. Um, the reality is there is unbelievable leadership training and context that comes that is very valuable to building the sort of healthcare system that we all need to see and enjoy that comes from outside of the walls of a medical school. And I can certainly say that there's nothing different about me or Mike or Jeff and my co-founders or, or the rest of our executive team who doesn't have a medical degree. They care just as much about our patients and the way that we care for them as, as we do. And there's a little bit of, uh, I, I genuinely think that the great clinician leaders can remove that sanctimoniousness and bring everybody into the fold and say, uh, you know, you, you don't have to have a medical degree to care deeply about patients and to practice medicine with integrity. And I have said since day one, whether you're a doctor or a nurse, or a phlebotomist, or the driver who picks our patients up, or the analyst on the population health team who's building the machine learning model who's going to help us optimize our, our diabetes workflows, uh, you're all taking care of patients. Uh, we just all do it very differently. So I, I would say a very loud and direct no, and just hope that uh, either folks can find an organization that shares those views or be a part of the change and create organizations that do. How do you see Walmart, Amazon, and some of these other non-healthcare giants playing a role in the future of medicine, um, you know, and impacting hospital operations since many are right now trying to enter the market? Yeah, I mean, Walmart's the best, right? Obviously, because they partner with Oak Street. But despite the no, um, I, listen, I, I think it, it is a it is an interesting sort of related point to my last editorialization. There is to say. Um, these are very large organizations with lots and lots of capital, incredible technology resources and expertise, and 20% of the American economy and growing is healthcare. So there's no way they're not going to participate. Now, the ways that they choose to participate, I think, are where it's going to be really interesting. Um, I, you know, I, there are certainly problems that we could have uh, help solving that I think they're uniquely positioned to solve. Um, our bet at Oak Street, which, um, you know, I think 20 years ago, people may have said is weird. And I think people today are still saying it's weird that you don't need brick and mortar. Um, I fundamentally disagree with that. Like I live in a house that is brick and mortar and I go to restaurants. Well, I, I used to that are brick and mortar. Um, we will always have some element of, of brick and mortar in the way that we exist as, as humans. And I'm not worried at all that Elm Street Health is going to be downloadable and totally replace Oak Street. I'm also not worried that on the timeline of, of my lifetime uh, that we won't have physical centers to take care of patients. Now, they may look very different, um, but I think, you know, I guess what I would say is this. When I am in Chicago, I have a house in Chicago. When I walk to our office, I walk past the little Amazon shop on Clark and, uh, and LaSalle, or not Clark and LaSalle, on uh, Lake and LaSalle, Lake and Clark. 
you guys get me. Anyway, uh, I find it deeply interesting as a guy who exists on 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 Amazon Prime, right? Because there there are very limited uh, sort of shopping resources uh, where I live in Western Wyoming. I can get everything I want from Amazon. I find it deeply interesting that they have that capacity to bring that to me, yet they have still also chosen to build brick and mortar centers in certain locations. Um, that is where I think the problem gets very interesting and where they can help us. Uh, Walmart's a great example. That is, I am convinced that is the path to solving rural health care. And it's part of the reason I'm so excited about the work that we're doing with them. Um, and then going back to our previous question, Amazon and the others certainly have an opportunity to improve the, the experience of receiving care remotely or digitally and how they enable that uh, with, with drones and remote monitoring and Alexa and all these other things. I'm, I'm really, really excited about and very much see it as a compliment to what we're doing. And frankly, for us at Oak Street, the way our business model works is if Amazon or one or any of these tech platforms create something that helps us take better care of our patients, 100% our business model aligns with us buying, paying them for that service uh, and extending that to our patients in so far as it, as we always say, it keeps our patients happy, healthy and out of the hospital. Um, a little bit of a broader question here. What are three things that you think the next administration should do to make healthcare more efficient and bend the cost curve downward? Um, I typically think in threes. I don't think that we need three. And uh, I will also say that for, for folks, I've spent quite a bit of time um, working on policy, thinking with the really smart career servants at CMS and CMMI on this. And regardless of your political affiliation, we went from, uh, from the ACA through a very, very different administration over the last four years to this next administration. And the names changed at the top of CMS and CMMI and um, the career servants largely did not. But when you think about the number one initiatives and, and CMMI who folks who are maybe not as close, um, so President, Cabinet, Department of Health and Human Services, Cabinet Secretary, CMS, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Studies reports up to that Cabinet Secretary. Center for Medicare and Medicaid Studies runs Medicare and Medicaid. Within CMS, there's something called CMMI, which is the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. And that is the group that is really thinking about demonstrations and other models that will change as we evolve our healthcare system. Uh, it was really responsible for so much of the work around creating ACOs and other payment reform mechanisms. And I give you that background to say is those folks have really not changed their orientation from, you know, 2010 ish when they were first getting started to today across very, very, very different administrations. Um, they launched uh, earlier in the year, actually announced a, a program called the Direct Contracting Program that is sort of the most advanced uh, and I would personally say the most elegant bit of policy making I've seen at a CMS probably in my lifetime. And what I mean when I say they need that one thing is they need to continue down that path of payment reform, getting us away from fee for service towards more value based models where for us as Boothies, there is a functioning price mechanism to allocate resources to their best and highest use. Uh, we should not continue to pay over and over and over and over again for, you know, for example, elected joint replacements before we've tried a whole bunch of things that we know to work in most settings uh, like physical therapy. And is there a right time and right setting for a joint replacement? Yes. Um, but for us as taxpayers and for many of us as as patients, we we need a thoughtful allocation of resources. And that only comes from these value based methodologies. And I am very confident uh, based upon the consistency that we've seen across um, across administrations, they're going to continue to do that. So the one thing that's going to make the biggest difference is to continue to see value based practices. And where that begins to flow down is a recognition that, you know, then if you have two drugs and one is way more expensive than the other and they are equivalent, this one stops getting paid for. There's no mechanism for that today, and that's where this takes us. And so rather, this is just you know a little bit of my. Um, perhaps residual libertarian streak from my time in Hyde Park. But, you know, I, rather than try to regulate my way out of high drug prices, what I'd love to do is to create a mechanism where we, listen, I would love to see everybody get access to health care in terms of funding source through Medicare and Medicaid and the like, but have those dollars be allocated in value-based mechanisms like global budgets, like we have at Oak Street. Uh, and I hope there will be more out there. And that's how we'll figure out how to bring cost and quality in line. 
Oak Street's a great example of how business benefits society and can also make money, right? But how do you have thoughts on how companies can measure value more holistically rather than just the bottom line? It's funny you asked that. About uh, two, two and a half years ago, we had a, a booth student group come out and spend some time with me and a team at Oak Street um, building out our social impact dashboard and essentially saying outside of the economics, right? Because we're the way that we traditionally report on the health of the business are the three financial statements. And that does capture in large part the, the overall health from an economic standpoint of the business. There are lots of other impacts that, that we have related to job creation and diversity and increasing safety and education and, uh, you know, access to resources in neighborhoods and, and things like that. So we went through a process with that group and put together a social impact dashboard um, that in perfect Oak Street fashion was incredibly structured and that we could go through and, and maintain over time. And for us, it did, you know, it, it's one of these things where, um, listen, every business wants to get as much done with as little as possible. But when when you do go into communities and, and through that process, we found out that, you know, our centers were creating, you know, for each center, upwards of 100 jobs in the community um, that around us we could watch, you know, where my practice used to be at 43rd and State on Wednesdays, I'd take care of patients there. When we first built that center, there was nothing around. Uh, now there's a nice convenience store next door across the street. There's a salon. Uh, the parking lot in the park got rebuilt. There's just a bunch that goes along with that that um, we've been able to measure and quantify and report on. And I would I would say, for sure, um, you know, obviously for us to keep doing what we do, we have to make sure that the three financial statements tie and and are favorable. But a lot of this other stuff matters. And I will say, going back to our previous comments around values. Um, the vast majority of folks who come to work for an organization are not coming for the healthy financial statements. They're coming because they share values and they share the impact and they want to be a part of that and they want to be proud of what they do. And I would say if, if, if a business is not taking advantage of measuring and reporting those things and thinking, communicating those things with their teammates, I think it's a real missed opportunity. Um, do you have any initiatives to improve the recruitment of your patients into clinical trials, which have difficulties in meeting um, targets across a wide range of treatment areas? Yeah, this has been uh, something that we have heard a lot more about lately. I, I will say to start that for folks who are familiar, uh, number one, we don't have a great history of being inclusive in our patient populations in many clinical trials. And so there's an increased focus in this important moment in our country and really around the world to do that. That's item number one. I think the second thing, and, and I have said this to our team a lot and, and had a lot of partnership with great leaders on our team in this regard, uh, we don't have a great history in this country, um, in when, especially when it comes to you know, if you have not read the stories of Henrietta Lacks and the Tuskegee syphilis experiments, you need to read those. And that, that is important uh, canon for anybody involved in taking care of patients and really recognizing that there are many people in this country who have many good reasons to not trust the healthcare system. And I think my number one duty and our number one duty at Oak Street is to never violate that trust. All that being said, certainly there are opportunities in enrolling the patients that we have the privilege of caring for at Oak Street in clinical trials that can benefit them directly and that can benefit their, their neighbors in the scientific community. Um, we are just beginning to have some of those conversations. Um, it has not been priority. I, I do genuinely know as so many, there are lots of companies being started in this space now, um, that it is an economic opportunity that is far secondary to us, to, to the reality of being able to connect our patients with those resources while at the same time protecting their trust. So um, certainly something that we're willing to explore and, and uh, but we'll do so in the context of always protecting our patients and putting their interests in need first. A couple of questions about the um, Oak Street model. Um, what's the role of peer support, support in your model? <clears throat> Patient peer support, I presume? Uh, I assume so, yes. Yeah, I, so I, I think, um, you know, this is obviously a different time and the idea of spending time with peers when you're uh, an, an like the average Oak Street patient is 
a 69 year old African American woman with six chronic conditions who takes 11 medications, has a high school education, lives alone, uh, and and has about twenty three thousand dollars a year worth of income. So that's that's our average person. The idea right now that that person has extensive social support, right? When they don't have social support in in the beginning, you know, before the pandemic, is is just worth worthy of note. We at Oak Street have community centers in every one of our centers with a sort of junior social worker like person who staffs that center. Every day there are multiple events going on. We offer transportation to and from the center and they really have become, they are called a community centers. They are a center for that community. It is not just open to Oak Street patients. And um, that has become a big part of engaging patients in their social environments. Similarly, we've now begun work with a group that helps us create communities of like affiliation groups, whether it's, you know, uh, knitting or movies or computer coding or even senior speed dating, putting those things together in our centers. And we've now begun to extend those into virtual communities. So it is a core part of our model. Um, we've done some work, and I will say this just because nobody ever publishes negative studies. We've done some work on, on creating peer groups and doing group visits. And the reality was it was um, underwhelming to say the least. And it doesn't mean that we won't go back down that path, but we found other mechanisms of engaging patients in their community and creating that social connection to be more powerful. There's quite a few students on the, the call today and there's several questions asking, you to give them some advice as to what they should be doing in their MBA, you know, to end up being a successful entrepreneur like you. <laughs> I wouldn't say like me just to be a successful entrepreneur, let's say. Um, yeah, I, I would say three things. I would say number one, um, really understand your values. And, and I know that I said that before, but, uh, you know, if you if you were choosing a career ahead of choosing values, then you're always going to kind of be like looking in your rearview mirror. And what I would say is get very, very clear what the mission of your life is and what those values are and and then allow yourself to evolve into picking the career path that fits with those. I think the second thing is um, be really deliberate about your management style and your leadership style. And I think about those things very differently. Um, Find the mentors and, and, the, and the leaders that you admire and be really clear, write those things down and, and know what those are. Because if you know your values, and you're going down a path and then you, you've been really deliberate about the kind of leader that you want to be. You've knocked out the first two things. And then I think the third thing is, um, you know, I, I heard Stephen Levitt interview uh, this week and he said this and it just kind of stuck with me. It's like, uh, you know, life is short, but life is long. And I certainly was in a hurry. Um, and I think I missed out on a lot of really important learnings and had some priorities wrong earlier on. It was just too focused on, too focused on, on my career and trying to, um, you know, get an MBA while I was working and, and then work and try to start a company and do a residency and, and do all these other things. And I think getting a booth MBA is enough. That is, that is enough right now, do that. And if at the same time you can clarify your values and find the kind of leader you wanna be, uh, the rest of these things will will come. And if I had to throw in, um, if I had to throw in one last little thing, cause I usually stick to just three. So maybe this will be like three with an asterisk on it. I would just always remember that um, we as a society, we make things prestigious because otherwise people wouldn't do them. And I wouldn't worry too much about prestige. Um, do what's important to you. And if you're successful, that's prestigious. One last question for you, um, which always seems to come up quite a bit. So I will ask it of you. What's the last book you've read? <laughs> um, I have about four books right now. Um, so I'm reading uh, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance right now. Uh, I don't often do a lot of fiction, but uh, it was recommended to me. Um, and I'm kind of halfway through it. Uh, let's see, what was the last nonfiction book? You know, I read a book that was written by a woman named Lori Gottlieb called uh, Maybe You Should Talk to Someone. 
And I heard an interview, there's a great podcast uh, called The Drive, and he interviewed her. And she has had a really interesting career. She was uh, in media and entertainment and worked on set at, at ER, when it was a famous show at NBC back in the 90s, and got interested in medicine, went to medical school, and uh, then dropped out of medical school uh, to become a writer, and then went back to become a, a clinical psychologist. And she wrote a book uh, just about her life and her career and taking care of patients as a clinical psychologist. And I thought that uh, her interview was very compelling. And I loved the way that she just uh, seemingly stream of consciousness, but very consistent with her values, had chosen a very unique career path. And she wrote a really interesting book. So for fiction, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, which is fun because I love working on Land Cruisers, and uh, Lori Gottlieb's, uh, maybe you should talk with someone. Thanks, Griffin. Um, I will turn it back over to Madhav. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, so a couple of different things, Griffin. One, um, my, my dad was an emergency physician as well. And one of the things he always mentioned was that he hated all of the TV shows about doctors and ERs and things like that. What is your take on them? <laughs> I, I got to be honest with you. I've never watched an episode in my life. Um, it probably would have prepared me better. I really cannot explain for for clinicians who are watching this, and I guess for everybody, I literally had never been in an emergency department before I started my residency. And the whole thing was just, I was hilariously unprepared. Um, but I, I will say an unbelievable privilege. And for me, it was really the crucible of leadership training because uh, whether, whether you're running a company or trying to fly an airplane or whatever, uh, running traumas with a team of people and family terrified and screaming outside um, and a whole bunch of people counting on you is a very quick way to learn to put ice water in your veins. And I'm very, very grateful for that privilege. Uh, one last question, a forward looking statement, but not about Oak Street. Uh, taking advantage of your medical training, what is your uh, over under, if you will, on when we'll have a good vaccine for COVID? Uh, I am I am quite hopeful, and I had a conversation about this last night. I think it is worthwhile as human beings just to step back and think about. Uh, I am a huge LeBron James fan. I find him to be an unbelievable leader and athlete. And the good news is we get to watch him perform in the moment. Uh, over the last nine months, the species has come together, and we never got to watch the LeBron James equivalents um, do what they do. But in nine months, to advance the science to the place where we have, where they have, and to be in a place where we have those results from Pfizer uh, is completely remarkable. And I have lots of questions about the supply chain uh, and how we're gonna get, frankly, enough inventory in place. But I will tell you this, within all bounds of, of physics and reality, if Pfizer gives us a vaccine that works, we will find a way to get it to our patients and our communities at Oak Street. And I know there are lots of other organizations will do it. And um, that data is, is uh, incredibly hopeful and I try to be balanced, but I'm optimistic that pending supply chain middle half of next year, you know, we, we can have, uh, we can have a vaccine that works. And I think the big challenge now is, will we find the leadership at the international, national, and then local community level to get people of all ages and stripes to take that vaccine so that we can finish this thing off? Griffin, thank you very much. This was, I really appreciate how open, thoughtful, and incredibly insightful you've been. Uh, I learned a lot. I think our, our community is, is thrilled to at first have you as a member. We're very proud of all the things that you've accomplished as an alum. And we really appreciate you taking the time to come today to share your uh, wisdom and insights. Thank you so much, Griffin. Thank you. Good to be here. Appreciate it very thank much. You. Real honor. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much, everyone.